pronouns are she, her, and I am speaking to you all from the South Caribbean coast of Costa Rica on Bribri and Quebec our land. And I am an intersectional environmentalist, farmer, environmental activist, and I helped to found a movement called Liberation Permaculture, which really advocates for a permaculture movement that puts people care and fair share, I think, at the forefront and really advocates for a diverse permaculture movement where um, anyone can be a part of it and really honors indigenous leaders as, as the leaders of the climate movement. Um, I'm going to start with sharing just a little bit about my own story and background as I think it's very relevant and will help you all understand a little bit about how I, I got to where I am. Um, so I was born in China and I was adopted at one years old by a single mom from upstate New York. And shortly after I was adopted, she was tragically diagnosed with terminal cancer and passed away when I was six. And I then went to live with her sister and brother-in-law, who I, I would consider my mom and dad. And growing up, um, I, I grew up in an, an Irish Catholic family in a predominantly affluent white neighborhood. And being a Chinese woman and young girl in that time was really confronting for me. And my family didn't really talk about race a ton. I actually remember when I was about eight years old or so, I think that other kids were starting to um, understand the concept of race and maybe making comments about me being Asian in school. And I, my mom actually had to explain to me how I was adopted and that I was Chinese and, and that I was kind of different from the other kids in that way. Um, when I was 13, my mom, my then mom number three, passed away suddenly, and my dad actually passed away last month. So that's the very short, um, succinct version of my kind of upbringing and family story. But the point in sharing that is I think my whole life I really craved and desired and yearned for this sense of belonging that I, I never really had either from my family or just from from the culture and my community in America that I grew up in. And I think what a lot of people in our world today do um, with this kind of lack of belonging is we turn to, to superficial things, whether that's brand names or the clothes we wear, you know, walking down the street, you can, you can judge so many things about another person. And I think, as all of you probably know, um, those things don't really give you a true sense of belonging. And I, I definitely tried to fill that void in my teenage years, um, yeah, using just um, clothes and who I hung out with and social media and, and all of these superficial things, but it didn't really work. And I think when things started to change, um, I went to Cornell University, which is in Ithaca, a small hippie town in upstate New York. And that's when I really first saw what Charles Eisenstein refers to as a more beautiful world our hearts know is possible. And I really love that phrase and it really resonates with me a lot. But in Ithaca, it's this really incredible progressive little town with a, a really strong local food and farming community. Um, the kind of emergence of a solidarity economy and, and just really amazing initiatives. And I was lucky enough to really become immersed in that community in my undergrad years. And through my studies, I chose to study international agriculture and development, as well as community food systems. And I got to start traveling around the world and working with different um, local food and farming communities and different farmers all over the world. And um, through all of that, I kind of, it just kept coming back to me that all of these problems are, are so connected and intersectional, which at first gave me a lot of a lot of doom and gloom and pessimism of you know you can't talk about our health crisis without talking about the food crisis and the climate crisis and you can't talk about that without talking about capitalism and you know the problems with our education system and all of these different collapsing systems in our world that are no longer serving us are just so intertwined, which at first I was like, wow, we have such little hope and there's so much to do. And it just feels so overwhelming. And it feels like 
our generation and as a young per as a young person we just have the weight of the world on our shoulders and at the same time um or a bit after kind of realizing that there's there's a beauty in it all being so connected because as soon as you start to fix one thing it has this ripple effect and around the same time is when i kind of discovered permaculture and it was in one of the first um, few weeks in college i was in an intro to sustainable agriculture class and i remember the class was specifically it was introduction to organic agriculture and we kind of talked about the history of organic ag and the usda certification and i remember the very last slide of the class um, it was titled beyond organic and it listed a few different things it listed agroecology, permaculture, and La Via Campesina. And I remember our professor just saying that these are kind of things that are one step beyond organic. And in that time, like I said, I had a lot of gloom and doom about um, the climate crisis and all these different things. And I was like, well, if these are things that are one step beyond organic, why aren't we doing those? That should absolutely be at um, the forefront. And I kind of took this really deep dive into the permaculture world. And I was really lucky in that I took my first permaculture design course at a farm and education center um, in the town that I live in now in the Caribbean of Costa Rica. It's called Finca Tierra. And um, it was founded by a couple and the woman, her name is Anna Gaspar and she's a huge role model and mentor to me. And she's actually a lawyer and uh, practiced as a lawyer before becoming a permaculture teacher and full-time homesteader. And prior to starting Finca Tierra, she was a legal advisor for indigenous rights to Costa Rican Congress. So she's basically, she's just a badass. And she had traveled around Costa Rica for almost a decade, learning from and spending time with all the different indigenous groups. And she's lucky and fortunate enough to just have great friends and connections to all the different groups here. And so when her and her husband decided to start this permaculture project, they really approached it from a, a place of humility and from a place of being students and listening and really valuing indigenous knowledge and cosmovisions as you know, the most important and um, incredible information and um, yeah, just resources that they could have. And it's had such a big impact, I think, on the way that they run their center and their permaculture design course. And they spend a whole section of their PDC with a local Quebec man, which is one of the indigenous groups here, learning from him and about their Cosmovision. So that was the, in, the kind of the my personal intro to permaculture. And it just inspired me immensely. And permaculture being this incredible just by nature interse intersectional thing that wasn't just about food and farming and the environment but that was really about people and how do we organize and govern ourselves and in social justice it was just like to me it was like oh this is finally like a movement and thing that i resonate so strongly with so i began helping to teach and facilitate facilitate pdcs and um again just seeing more feeling more of a sense of belonging and this more beautiful world our hearts know is possible and um, gaining like an a immense connection to the natural world. Um, Ian, who's the husband of Anna who run Finca Tierra, he is a total plant nerd. And I, I know that he says every course he talks about how now we kind of, you know, like I was saying before, you, you walk around a city and you can immediately recognize brand names or if someone has an iPhone or AirPods and all these different things. And when he walks around the farm, he, he recognizes trees and plants and is like cheesy and hippie as that might sound. It's, it's something that I think we're missing so much in our, our culture today and that humans are social animals, but we also just have this and can have this profound connection to the natural world. And there's this one like 10 year old uh, breadfruit tree on the farm. And he always says like, he can look to it and say, you know, I knew you when you were this big and they have this reciprocal relationship. And he actually feels a real like part of his social life is, is his relationship with plants. And um, yeah, so I, I got a really, really deep um, connection to the natural world in that way. 
At the same time in Costa Rica, there is, you know, a, a really emerging permaculture movement and a lot of people, especially foreigners from the US and Europe moving here to kind of live their dream permaculture life. And as I kept seeing this in the town that I live in and in the country at large, I just saw the disparities happening there in that there would be, for example, um, a family, you know, growing all their own food and living here and down the road, there are campesinos or peasant farm working workers working on banana plantations for Chiquita or Dole who are living in abject poverty, um, you know, genuinely facing starvation and very much feeling the firsthand effects of chemical pesticide use um, and all of these things. And it, the question kind of kept coming to me of, is it really your dream life or your dream permaculture life if your neighbor down the road is struggling in these immense ways? And I think it applies to wherever you are, if you're in a city or anywhere. Um, just that social justice aspect became ultra relevant to me. I also became really interested in intentional communities and what I kept learning from spending time with them and gaining firsthand experiences. You know, communities never fail because um, the tomatoes didn't grow or because a, a pest came through, you know, they fail because humans can't get along. So it, it just like in my permaculture journey, journey, that people aspect just kept being the thing that, you know, again, we struggled the most with. Um, and at the same time, I was seeing just more inequalities in the movement, whether it was with um, male leaders in the movement kind of taking advantage of their positions. Um, most of the cent successful centers in Costa Rica are run by American or European men. And if a Costa Rican tries to start one, they very rarely succeed. Um, you know, just examples of like outright racism, a lot of people of color not feeling comfortable in PDCs. And at the same time, I was also starting to see more and more negative criticisms of the permaculture movement online and kind of in the global environmentalist space. And specifically, there was one talk or quote that I saw from Leah Penniman. She's the author of Farming While Black and the founder of Soulfire Farm. And she's a woman who I respect immensely for her work with food justice. And she said in a talk, she said, to say an unpopular thing, permaculture isn't really real. Permaculture is the amalgamation of a number of indigenous agroecology technologies that have been rebranded, packaged, and sold mostly by college educated white men to turn a profit on their courses. But the actual techniques that they have rebranded as permaculture do exist. And I think it's so important for us to honor the source of each of them by learning about the history, naming them, and if we're going to pay royalties to anyone, to pay royalties to those indigenous people who created the technologies. And I remember reading this and just being absolutely speechless because while I don't agree with everything that Leah said, I think there's so much truth in it. And I had spent, you know, the last, it was probably at that point, six years of my life really um, associating myself with the permaculture movement. And it was kind of this ego check of, is that really true? There was so much truth that I saw in this. There was also an element of defensiveness that I felt. Um, and I continued to see more criticisms and kind of started talking with peers in my own community and real life friends in the movement. And I kind of had a few choices at that point. I could either ignore these criticisms and just pretend or not pretend, but just only acknowledge the, the positive pretty sides of permaculture um, I could completely dissociate myself from the movement or I could kind of move forward with trying to improve it and make it better. And that's the route that I took. And part of it is just also having facilitated in so many different PDCs, permaculture and specifically the PDC, it's, it's such a transformational and empowering course. And for me personally, again, it gave me that immense sense of belonging and just hope for the world. And I know how much positivity permaculture can have, and it's not something that I wanted to give up on. Um, so naturally just starting these conversations with different friends and colleagues, mostly in the Costa Rican permaculture movement, we started talking about these different themes of social justice and permaculture, decolonizing permaculture. And as we started having these conversations, it kind of naturally grew and 
different friends who teach courses reached out to other people and more and more and suddenly we had a group of about 50 permaculture practitioners from around the world, including quite a few prominent people in the movement um, talking about these issues and it was kind of like we well we need to do something about it um, and we decided to put out three different publications um, they are what is permaculture what is social permaculture and decolonizing permaculture which are three different things that i'm really proud of where we start to delve delve into these um different problems that i've, I've been talking about like not you know properly naming and giving the honors and respect and money to a lot of indigenous groups that permaculture borrows practices from to addressing sexism within the movement racism the inaccessibility of the pdc and all these different things and the the start of liberation permaculture was very much a um just the start of a conversation really that we hope to be i think of a forever conversation and that permaculture by nature is is this decolonizing force and that everything about it is going against capitalism colonialism and, and imperialism and it's all about being in right relation to in relationship to a place but the permaculture movement we all have to recognize was conceived within today's world which it's nested in all of these oppressive systems such as white supremacy sex the patriarchy and sexism and capitalism and colonialism etc so it kind of needs to constantly be addressed and since starting liberation permaculture and we we chose the name liberation permaculture because we really wanted to focus on the positive when when talking about decolonizing it's kind of talking about what we don't want which is very important but we we would like to get a point where we can talk about what we do want and that's you know liberation from all of these oppressive oppressive systems for everyone but as this movement has grown it's been incredibly gratifying and um yeah just so many people have reached out saying how affirming the work we're doing is sharing their own experience with experiences with permaculture whether negative or positive and just said that um, these conversations that we're having and trying to hold space for um, have just been very affirming to them so that's been really incredible and i think for me this learning process has really just been about you know permaculture is really it's about humans it's about how do humans create right relationships with each other in the natural world the rest of the natural world has it figured out and we can choose to be a part of that or not but it really is anthropocentric and and human focused and i think for a lot of my time at the beginning of my permaculture journey i was really in that kind of plant nerd, fruit nerd community, especially in Costa Rica, but I'm sure everywhere in that, you know, I felt like people were were wanting to brag about the fact that they could name the scientific species of a rare fruit or name all the different nitrogen fixing trees in an area. And while that is really important information, it just wasn't making me feel passionate or excited anymore, where the the people aspect and the social aspect was. And also since I've started this work, I think a lot of people have questioned, you know, I was full time farming for quite a few years and while I still do as much as I can, I've definitely veered towards more community work and people work and I guess just realizing that that like is permaculture just as much as growing food and farming is um, the people aspect figuring out how we can all get along. Um, is is permaculture that's you know social justice is permaculture decolonization is permaculture and permaculture really has to mean liberation for everyone and i think that people aspect of it is really what sets it aside from other movements and what makes it so revolutionary so yeah i just want to end by saying i'm i'm really grateful for guy and toad at permaqueer and for all the work they're doing um they've really helped to dream up this permaculture movement that I really envision for the future. And yeah, thank you for having me.